so welcome everyone. Uh, we've got an, a great a great event for you tonight. We're going to be doing a tour of the Ben Gurion House in Tel Aviv. Uh, we're joined by uh, David and Rona, who both work uh, at the Ben Gurion House in Tel Aviv, uh, and they'll be the ones facilitating the tour as well. Uh, a bit of a background of the the house and the tour. Um, so the house in Tel Aviv was the private home of Paula and David Ben Gurion, the first Prime Minister of Israel. The house was built in the early 1930s in Tel Aviv and, and served the Ben Gurion family as their main home until they set, uh, settled in Steboker uh, in the southern Negev desert. In his last will, Ben Gurion uh, left the house to the state of Israel. And in 1974, a year after his death, the house was uh, became open to the public as a museum uh, and an educational and cultural center. The house tells both a national story and it sheds light on the backstage of um, some critical moments in the early years of the state of Israel. Uh, and a personal story through an unmediated encounter with Ben Gurion's private figure and lifestyle. The different rooms show original furniture, historical artifacts uh, that reflect David Ben Gurion's daily life as well as his public career. They will see the living room, private bedrooms, and the kitchen, as well as his study and private library, an extensive and inspiring collection of more than 20,000 books in more than 30 languages, covering a wide field of subjects from ancient Greek philo philosophy and biblical studies to modern military history. The tour itself will provide a unique behind the scenes look to some of the critical moments in Israel's history, as well as a personal encounter with Ben Gurion's character, getting to know his life story and teaching us lessons on leadership, decision making, courage and determination. During the tour, we're going to focus on Ben Gurion's relationship with the diaspora uh, and we'll shed some light on the relevance his legacy left as the architect of the state of Israel. Uh, so from there, I'm going to hand it over to David and Rona from the Ben Gurion house in Tel Aviv and let them take it away. Right, thanks a lot, Joey, for the introduction. And uh, hi, everyone, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon from Tel Aviv. We're at 11 a.m. here. It's a lovely morning, with like 24 degrees or something like that. Uh, we are in uh, central Tel Aviv on Ben Gurion Boulevard, if anybody knows it. Uh, the sea is actually not far down the street. And uh, here we are at the Ben Gurion house that I'm happy to show you around today for a little while. Uh, as Joey mentioned in his introduction, uh, this is basically uh, the private residence of the Ben Gurion family. And uh, according to his last will, it became a public institute in 1974. Uh, that's when the name of the street, by the way, was also changed to Ben Gurion Boulevard. It was a uh, Karen Kayemet Street before. Uh, so my name is David. I'm in charge of uh, public relations here in the house. Uh, with me is uh, Rona, head of our uh, guiding department. Uh, and she will also tune in uh, every now and then for questions and inputs. And um, a few words about the house that we can see now. Uh, as also, I think, Joey mentioned, it was built in the early 1930s. Uh, back then, it was actually a part of a worker's neighborhood. It's called Koalim neighborhood. Sorry, I heard something. Any question? Or we all right? Sorry, we're not getting any pictures. Yeah. I'm not. David, everything is okay. You can continue. Okay, great. So uh, this house was built as part of the Poalim neighborhood, the workers' neighborhood. Uh, back then, Ben Gurion is actually the head of the newly established labor movement in Israel, and uh, part of this neighborhood are houses for uh, the leadership of the labor uh, movement. And the house was later on enlarged in a few different stages, and we'll talk about it more inside. I suggest we go in. It's a bit loud out there with the cars. You might have also some visitors in and out around me because uh, we've actually reopened the place this week according to the new regulations. We are allowed to have up to like 10 people in the house, uh, which is very exciting, but we're still full on with the Zoom tools. Uh, so here we are on the living room of the Ben Gurion family on the first floor. Uh, the floor ties are also original from the 1930s. 
And uh, everything we will see today in the house is basically original furniture and artifacts uh, from the family, different uh, trophies, prizes, presents that uh, Ben-Gurion received throughout his life, uh, as well as everyday artifacts or uh, family uh, photos and other memorabilia. Um, the living room, as I said, was part of the original house. You can also see it by the floor tiles, the green ones, and the later down the corridor is actually what was uh, enlarged in the 1940s. So uh, the house wasn't exactly in this configuration at start. And uh, what we see now is the later years when it's also a more official house and uh, well, much higher standard maybe for receiving guests. But uh, it is important to mention that uh, at any point in time, this wasn't an official residence of the prime minister or of the head of the Jewish agency or other uh, official titles that he had throughout his career. This was always the private residence of the family, as well as the other house in the Negev Desert in Stebokel, to where they moved in 1953. Even after that, this house remained of the family and they divided their life between the two places. Uh, another fun fact is actually that corner over there with the fireplace, uh, that was also a later addition to the house from 1950. There was a particular unique hard winter in 1951, it even snowed in Tel Aviv, and uh, the family decided that they need another addition to the living room with a nice little fireplace. Uh, to be honest, we also talked about it with the conservatrice of the house. Uh, we are not sure if it was actually in use more than like twice or three times at, at most. Uh, in, and uh, I think I saw something on the chat. Indeed, some of the paintings are missing right now because they're off to a special workshop to have them preserved. But uh, we do have uh, family photos. Here we have uh, all three children of Ben-Gurion. His uh, oldest uh, daughter, the firstborn, is Geula, uh, Amos, and the youngest, Renana. Uh, the little statues, by the way, uh, we can cross-check with pictures from the time that the, they actually lived in the house. They were also there. Some of the furnitures were moved or uh, during the year after his death and before the opening of the museum. Uh, uh, there were some changes, but uh, many of the things are still original and more or less even in the same place. Uh, another uh, interesting little prize that you got over there is uh, his ivory from the president of Liberia from the state visit in June 1962. Uh, not the most politically correct gift to bestow nowadays, but uh, back then maybe a symbol of honor. And uh, from there I'll move on to some of the things that we have on display here. Uh, you see all sorts of medals, from um, the French Legion of Honor and uh, different countries in Africa. I think there is an British uh, honors as well somewhere. And also different trophies from um, organization and municipalities within Israel. We have uh, different honors from the city of Jerusalem, from Tel Aviv, uh, the key to the city of Ramat Gan, uh, different uh, cities, municipalities, organizations within Israel that throughout his life uh, give him also uh, different honors and token of their appreciation. And uh, as we saw the different medals from the foreign uh, honors, we have uh, another very special present here that he received from Unu, the first prime minister of, uh, of Burma, uh, who was also a very close personal friend of Ben-Gurion. And this is a nice little lion carved of ivory. Um, this also tells a story of Ben-Gurion as a diplomat. I mean, we saw different uh, presents from municipalities and places in Israel, but also from uh, leaders and countries abroad. Uh, he did travel a lot and throughout his travels, uh, we can also emphasize two different uh, other things outside of, uh, let's say diplomatic or uh, state meetings. He also bought many books, as you will see later upstairs, and also visited the local Jewish communities. And indeed, many of the presents that we can see here are actually presents that he got from the local Jewish communities throughout his travels. Uh, this uh, little 
model replica of the Liberty Bell is uh, from a community in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, this one, this little statue is from the Jewish community in Argentina, uh, who was a particularly moving visit for Ben Gurion. And there are also many other presents from different uh, communities in the diaspora. I do admit that we checked. We didn't find any present from uh, Australian uh, communities, uh, but many other places. Uh, moving on to the second room in the house, in the first floor. This uh, was originally the room of Renana, the youngest daughter. Uh, when the Ben-Gurions moved here in 1930, uh, the two older sons and daughter didn't live with the parents already, but uh, the youngest Renana did. And then when she moved out, uh, as you can guess uh, what the parents did with the new vacant room, they quickly made it to a new study. That's what Ben-Gurion did, and started filling it up with his books, uh, from floor to ceiling. And uh, also, uh, maybe you can see uh, behind the window, uh, it's actually a bricked up wall. Uh, the story is that uh, when Ben-Gurion is using this room as a study, here is 1956, and that's when the Sinai campaign, the Mitzah uh, is happening, and at the same time, uh, something that was also characteristic to Ben Gurion, he was he fell ill. Uh, throughout his life, he wasn't a very healthy person, and especially at times of crisis, uh, it feels like almost, uh, I don't know, spiritually speaking, or uh, a very close connection between maybe body and mind, he fell ill especially around those crucial moments in his career or basically in the nation's history. So in 1956, when the Sinai campaign is full on, he is the Minister of Defense, the, which was also his second title as long as first prime minister. He was also the first uh, Minister of Defense. And uh, back then, uh, he couldn't even make it to the uh, headquarters of the army, not far here in Tel Aviv. So as uh, as we all discovered in this past year, the wonders of working from home, uh, Ben-Gurion already did it himself in 1956 when he fell ill and couldn't go to the army headquarters. And basically it was brought up here. Uh, the army engineers bricked up the wall uh, to make this room sort of a bunker. And the chief of the general staff came here every morning to plan the following day and operations. So uh, working from home already in the 1950s, already running a war from your own bed here in the house. And uh, other than that, when the place became a museum, uh, we decided to uh, curate this room as a room that focused on uh, Tzahal, on the establishment of the Israel Defense Forces unification of the previous organization into one, into Tzahal. And we can see, for example, a picture of Ben-Gurion and his wife, Paula, with the first uh, members of the first general staff of the army. Uh, the order of the establishment of the army is, of, is down there, framed and signed. And uh, different presence of uh, replicas or prototypes of the newly technological development of the Israeli uh, defense forces and the uh, defense industries that also uh, Ben-Gurion is assigned on their uh, establishment. So we have a uh, like miniature prototype of an Israeli fighter jet from 1960 or a naval ship or different uh, model shells. Even uh, uh, Hanukkah is coming up. We have a little uh, menorah made of uh, bullets over there, as you can see. So uh, this room is really pretty much all about his work as the first Minister of Defense and about the story of the establishment of uh, the IDF. And uh, moving on to the second room, uh, not a command center for a military campaign, but equally important, especially nowadays, uh, any guess by the light and the different things that you see around me? What room? Sorry, thanks. So the kitchen, of course. Uh, so this is essentially Paula Ben-Gurion's private little kingdom. And 
the items are more or less uh, as they were left here. So the fridge I can assure you is already empty. Uh, we do have a little grocery list, a menu, and even a little recipe handwriting by uh, Paula Ben-Gurion of her signature dish, the one that Ben-Gurion ate himself every morning. It's called the Kuch Munch, a word that she probably invented, invented herself. It's a sort of a mix of uh, yogurt and other soft cheese, uh, applesauce, and uh, some sweet and low sprinkled about it, above it. I'm not sure I would recommend it myself, but uh, Ben-Gurion actually ate it every morning. And uh, overall, I think the story of uh, Paula Ben-Gurion is that her life uh, mission was uh, supporting David Ben-Gurion. She was a nurse in her training. She took his weight every morning, insisted on his daily routine of uh, fixed breakfast, of uh, uh, napping in the afternoon, not skipping a meal, sleeping hours, all of that. Um, so a few last shots of the kitchen and this little dining table uh, before we move on in the first floor. Oops. So uh, moving on on the first floor next to the kitchen, uh, before we go to the little bedroom at the end of the corridor, I would like to focus here on some of uh, the pictures that we have of different uh, state meetings, diplomatic meetings, and uh, all in all Ben-Gurion's relations with other leaders and important figures. Uh, it can start with our own local history, uh, like uh, the first president of Israel, uh, Weizmann, or uh, the following prime minister, like Moshe Sharet, Golda Dayan, and uh, on to leading figures from the world. It can be European royals or um, Nobel Prize laureates, as well as uh, leaders, American presidents or African leaders, uh, the, the German Chancellor Adenauer and others uh, from different years throughout his life and um, really a little focus about uh, Ben-Gurion's vast uh, connections and relations with uh, different countries of the world and the importance that he gave uh, both to diplomatic relations and establishing uh, the young nation's name among, among the other nations of the world and they also nurturing uh, personal relations and friendship, as I said earlier, with different communities in the diaspora or with specific leaders that also became personal friends, uh, such as Unu, the prime minister of Burma that I've mentioned earlier. This is from a visit of Ben-Gurion over there in Burma to the Myanmar um, from 1961. Uh, on the opposite wall here in the corridor, we can see all sorts of uh, honorary degrees that Ben-Gurion received, uh, mainly from universities in Israel, but not only, I think we can see one from uh, Brandeis University. I've mentioned Burma earlier. There's also a doctor uh, of laws, like an honorary doctor from uh, the University of Rangoon, uh, in NYU, Colombia, but I think it's, even more exciting to see the Israeli degrees that we see here. I'm not sure how many Hebrew readers we have in the crowd. Uh, there is, of course, Yof Tel Aviv, is uh, the Technion, the uh, Technical Institute of Israel in Haifa, uh, that bestowed him uh, honorary doctors of architecture uh, as being the architect of the state of Israel. Honors uh, of his uh, pioneering activities and strength of spirit that uh, gave him uh, this degree of the architect of the state of Israel. And another fun fact, speaking of that, we will see it soon upstairs. There was, there's no doubt on Ben-Gurion's uh, intellectual abilities, uh, but his relation with that short. He didn't make it beyond the second year of law school. 
uh, in Istanbul because the outbreak of the First World War uh, cut that short. He had to leave Istanbul back uh, here to, uh, to Israel. Uh, but it didn't uh, prevent other universities later on to give him all those uh, degrees. Uh, so this little bedroom at the end of the corridor is actually Paula Ben-Gurion's um, private chamber, her little bedroom, uh, where she uh, can entertain or uh, rest or write some letters. Uh, this little desk uh, is also an original, including uh, this little uh, glass plate with the family photos beneath it. So uh, whenever she retired to her room, she could already surround herself with pictures of the kids, of uh, the children, the grandchildren, family members, close friends, and uh, so on. So a little private photo gallery uh, of her own, uh, vintage style. And um, I think we are ready to go up to the second floor. Uh, as you already see, probably, the Bengurians, especially at this uh, stage of their life are actually sleeping uh, apart. And uh, we will now move upstairs and see the second bedroom, uh, David Mengurian's bedroom. Uh, feel free to comment meanwhile. And uh, if you have any guess why do they sleep in separate bedroom, we'd be happy to hear on NI while I make it to the second floor. No. So, here we are on uh, the other bedroom, David Ben-Gurion's private bedroom. Uh, not much bigger than the one uh, of Paula downstairs, as you see. Um, a little vintage radio and uh, the Bible, another copy of the Bible. We will soon see the rest of the amounts of books that we have here in the house, but uh, I think it's safe to say that the Bible is the one that we have the most here. And it was particularly close to Ben-Gurion. He read a lot in the Bible, so even there's one next to his bed. Uh, the bed itself isn't that comfy, I can assure you. It's what we call the Soknut bed, the Jewish agency bed, the one that the Jewish agency provided to uh, immigrants in masses in the 1950s. Um, well, as I said earlier, Ben-Gurion was rather ill throughout his life, so maybe it helped with his back pains. Uh, not sure. Another thing that helped, by the way, is uh, Feldenkrais, the special um, physical activity that he engaged in uh, later on in his life. We will talk about it maybe soon. Uh, so, last shots of uh, the bedroom, just a little dresser, the bed, that's as simple as that. And um, to finish up the point about uh, the Ben-Gurion sleeping apart, uh, the fact is that uh, Ben-Gurion needed very little hours of sleep at night. He slept around three or four hours a night and was working for the rest of the time and particularly reading. So uh, Paula Ben-Gurion decided that she needs a good night's sleep and they decided to split up for the night. Uh, so Ben-Gurion can also work and that's because the opposite room for the bedroom is his study. So we can see his uh, desk over there and mainly uh, the library. So uh, this is the uh, very large private library of uh, Ben-Gurion. Uh, the collection wasn't this big from the start. It was a life long project of collecting books. Uh, yeah, it's impressive. It's uh, four rooms, actually. It's almost the entire second floor of the house is uh, for the library. 
uh, the first um, size configuration of the house, there was only one room at the second floor. Now there are three more, three more, and basically the need was uh, um, was there because the book collection kept growing and growing. Uh, so it started with a maybe smaller collection, but he kept collecting, kept buying books. As I said earlier, also when he, he traveled, he enlarged his collection, he received many books. Uh, and so we have this uh, big collection today. Can I show you it's four rooms? Otherwise there was a meal and you would have seen me. Uh, let's do a quick walk around and uh, then we can talk about what we have here inside of the books. Any guess about how many? Yeah, I'm getting 5,000 from Susie and uh, 10,000 from uh, another one. It, uh, the chat just closed. Uh, any other guess? Not far. Arbe Meod, indeed, uh, around 20,000 books uh, here in this library. Uh, downstairs, the first room that we saw, Renana's bedroom, uh, another thousand or so down there. And uh, Sde Boker, whoever visited there, maybe saw that there's a, a quite impressive library down there as well, uh, with around 5,000 books. Uh, but it, this is the main part of uh, the Ben Gurion books collection, and uh, with the biggest uh, amount of book, around twenty thousand. Uh, Language-wise, we have uh, around roughly to thirty-five languages uh, of different books. Uh, not to say that he himself read uh, thirty-five languages, but it's uh, not far from that. Actually, it's still quite impressive. He had the uh, reading abilities in around 11 languages. Uh, lots of them are one that he taught himself uh, in a later age. Uh, question from Susie. So as I said, around 11 languages, 11 languages, sorry. Uh, some of them he studied later on. Uh, that's why some of the books here, by the way, are uh, can also be um, dictionaries and uh, encyclopedias. So books that aren't necessarily uh, reading books from cover to cover, but uh, still they uh, fill up the different, uh, different worlds here with books. Uh, he did read a lot. He read uh, probably not all the 20,000 books here, especially the ones in languages that he didn't spoke himself. Um, but uh, we do cross reference with his journals that he kept very precisely or with different uh, inscriptions that we see on the first pages of some books, even some handwritten comments probably by himself. Uh, so we can cross reference and realize that he read, he read quite a few of uh, what he had here in the library. Now, uh, a part of the language, I think it's also relates to the story of uh, the content of what we have in the library. Um, the first room is more about mm -hmm. philosophy and political thought. We have Plato and other philosophers. Uh, we also have uh, lots of Judaism, Judaism and uh, Kabbalah. And uh, well, part of him being such a self-learning man, uh, he wasn't a great fan of translations. So he preferred to study ancient Greek in order to read Plato. Uh, same with Latin or uh, other languages that we see here. I mean, on the one side, he is a very curious man with very various fields of interest, as we will soon see what else we have here. And also uh, someone who like to base his decision on learning and puts lots of importance on learning. That's why this library, a part of being a learning space for him was also a meeting place with different experts. Uh, throughout his leadership and with some of the very crucial decisions that that he had to make um, before the Declaration of Independence and after. Uh, he tried to surround himself with uh, different experts of their fields. Uh, there's one in some famous seminars that took place here in the library. One is called Seminar Kakal, uh, with different leading figures from the um, uh, defense organization prior to the establishment of the IDF. 
uh, same meetings with the uh, rabbis or uh, writers and intellectuals. Um, <clears throat> he really uh, insisted of uh, grounding his decisions on knowledge as much as he could. And that's something that we also uh, emphasize to our visitors here. Um, at the study over there, we can also see a very special uh, bookshelf over there uh, with uh, <clears throat> uh, family books and memorial books of fallen soldiers. Uh, he really took the time to uh, interact with the citizens of Israel. Uh, we have lots of correspondence that we had with different um, uh, just uh, civilians of the country, particularly with children, which is very nice to see even now. Uh, we can see handwritten letters of uh, elementary school kids that writes to the prime minister, and he actually takes the time to answer them and uh, very directly and very fondly, so there's lots of correspondence of Ben-Gurions with kids. But what we have here, the memorial books, is another special relation that he maintained with families of fallen soldiers uh, from, the, from the War of Independence and on. He took the time, even if it was months or years after the, uh, the death of the soldiers, but after the publication of the in memoriam books, he took the time to read them and to write to the families. Uh, I saw a little comment about uh, how rare the books are and if people can use them or not. Uh, well, this little section is indeed the rarest books that we had. Some of them are dated to the 16th century. Uh, we have with us on the team a librarian that's also in charge of the conservation of the house. So uh, uh, you can't see it maybe, but I'm wearing an extra layer here that doesn't really suit the climate outside in Tel Aviv, but it is freezing here in the library. Uh, there are all different, uh, re different requirements that we have uh, in order to maintain this collection. So temperature, uh, humidity and stuff like that. Uh, but aside of the extremely rare books, all of the other books here are open to the public. That's actually part of uh, our mandate here because as uh, I said in the beginning, um, uh, we are uh, open to the public institution. It's part of his will. Uh, so the interpretation of his last will was to make the house a historical museum for the man and his figure and the family, but mainly uh, the rationale behind uh, his last will, why he bequeathed the house to the public was the, the understanding of how big and important this book collection is and that he wants to uh, pass it on to the public. So in our mandate, we are defined as an institution for reading and studying a public library, if you will. Uh, you can't take books home here, but you can come here and uh, have a read at the books. People do that, different researchers and historians and uh, Kabbalah experts, because there's the Kabbalah books behind me. And we have a, a Kabbalah lecture the other month with the... Um, the lecturer really took the time to go through the books and he was amazed about the different uh, things that we had. Not necessarily rare as in uh, very old and fragile, but something that was actually published very few times, uh, different rarest books from that end. Uh, I talked about a lot about uh, what we have here in the library, the first room. So we had philosophy and uh, Judaism and Kabbalah. Uh, the second room is uh, just as impressive with the amount of books, floor to ceiling. Uh, on the, the and the content wise, we have more uh, Judaism, but also uh, geography and hist uh, history of Zionism, history and geography all in all. We have a uh, historical geography of uh, Israel, of uh, previous times in Israel, of Palestine, of the Holy Land. We have uh, uh, different uh, pilgrims that uh, went to Israel. We have history books and um, also uh, maps of uh, Israel. Really, a section uh, devote, dedicate, dedicated, sorry, to uh, uh, the geography and history of the state of Israel and also of the region. We have um, 
I saw a question from students who classify the books. Uh, well, when the place during the preparation of the house as a museum, there was also a, people catalogized the entire collection. Uh, so, uh, and we still do that from time to time. We're going through the different books to see which one needs the uh, 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 repairs or if there's any collection. Uh, it was catalogized by the museum in the, its first years, but uh, the the arrangement of the different themes are more or less how Ben Gurion designed his own library. Um, and maybe we can also see this uh, linear, or maybe in the idea level, a connection between the different rooms from maybe the micro level to the macro level. We started with, uh, or from the macro to the micro, I don't know. We started with general political thought and ancient philosophy and Kabbalah to a more specific uh, knowledge fields about uh, uh, Israel, the history, the geography also of the Middle East, uh, history and geography of the Middle East and other nations. And particularly, uh, well, not the dino of a sports section. Uh, the last room is more to general social sciences, but uh, all in all, he wasn't really a sportsman. Uh, I said earlier that he was uh, quite ill throughout his life. Um, I will refer to that soon because I started to say that we have historical uh, uh, military history as well. Uh, he was one of the founders of the IDF, but personally, he didn't have a very uh, glamorous uh, career as a soldier. He was safe to say that he didn't really fought one day uh, in his life. He had a brief moment as part of the English military in the First World War. And that was that, but it didn't stop him to become the first prime minister and uh, effectively the founder of the IDF. And again, we come back to this knowledge-based leadership that we had. We had lots of books on military history of different nations of the world. And uh, going to a more spiritual areas, uh, we talked a lot about the Judaism that we had here. We also have lots of books of Christianity and Islam, different religions and especially uh, an entire section to different uh, religions and practices from the Far East that was also a later interest of Ben-Gurion. Uh, we have books of uh, meditation and Zen and Hinduism and Buddhism and uh, yoga books as well uh, that um, as he grew older and became maybe interested in more uh, vast spiritual questions, uh, he started to do a more uh, comparative uh, uh, view or readings of different religions and spiritualities uh, about the physical part and the question whether he had any particular sports that he liked. Uh, there's lots of yoga books, but he didn't practice yoga himself. Maybe some of you know a famous pictures, picture of him uh, standing on his head. Uh, well, that's because uh, he had a special, uh, he practiced a special, um, I say, physiotherapy or a, <clears throat> a practice that called Feldenkrais. Uh, it was developed by uh, Moshe Feldenkrais here in Tel Aviv. And uh, he and Ben Gurion, uh, he worked with Ben Gurion on his uh, physical condition. And uh, his rationale was that Ben Gurion himself was very ill from childhood. He read a lot and he didn't really got to play around as a child and enjoy his young body. So now at a later, at a later age, uh, reaching 70, what would he like to do with his body now? And he will make sure it will be possible. So Ben Gurion said, standing on my head. And he said, why not? And they worked together a lot on different exercise and uh, physiotherapy until at one point Ben Gurion did actually manage to do a headstand. And uh, there are some famous pictures of that, even a cute statue not far here on the beach in Tel Aviv. Uh, I think that sport question was a good point to um, open up for other questions because uh, the library I can talk about for hours and uh, I would love to hear or see if you have an open mic and camera or read on the chat. Uh, any thoughts or comments or questions? Um, I might jump in here as well and um, maybe ask some questions from the chat to you guys. Um, so one of the questions we had sent in to us was about whether or not, uh, or what are some unique uh, 
uh, facts that you guys have learnt about Ben Gurion, having been in the museum and having worked in the museum, uh, and maybe some facts that some people might not know about him. Mm, what um, <clears throat> two things that amazed me were uh, well the amount of sleep, three or four hours a night, and the dedication to readings. Uh, we laugh about it a lot, especially well this past six months or so that we've been in and oh, out of God. lockdowns and closed to uh, the public. Uh, it was actually an opportunity for us uh, to really go deeper in the library connect collections or the different uh, still uncatalogized uh, artifacts that we have in the house. Uh, it was a challenging time during lockdowns, but mm -hmm. um, uh, we had finally the time without visitors uh, around the house to first of all do Zoom tools, but also to uh, go through some of the, I guess, more, more remote cabinets and the hidden corners of the house and different projects that we didn't have time in our daily routine. So we found lots of uh, interesting uh, photo albums that we could then cross reference with other events that we know of or other gifts in the house. Uh, some of the um, uh, souvenirs and gifts that we have here, we didn't have the full picture of where exactly or when exactly were they from. And then suddenly we can see, discover this album from a state visit in somewhere and then cross reference and uh, have uh, little discoveries like that that really helped us uh, to get even a bigger understanding or even close down some loose ends about different uh, artifacts in the house that we weren't 100% sure about. Uh, so uh, the general biography uh, aspects are always um, inspiring and also the little discoveries that we still do, uh, we still have here even uh, after this museum is open for uh, almost 50 years, uh, there is so much still uh, to be explored. Very cool. Um, you touched on it briefly, but maybe speak a bit more on um, how the library is actually organized and classified and you know who or you know, how, how is it how is it set up and, and organized mm -hmm. uh, well the the collection of book was a lifelong hobby as i said and it started very early on and uh, well the first uh, library of the house before there was uh, an enlargement to do extra rooms on this floor was actually this room. And uh, that also, as I said, uh, well, the first two rooms were there and then uh, there was the addition of that one. And the third one, I didn't even took you all the way out there, uh, was actually a balcony. You can see still the uh, on the door that was a balcony uh, that was also closed and made into a room of books and a few other souvenirs that we have lying around. Uh, another ivory, this time from uh, Gabon in Africa. And uh, by the way, this part of the library is more uh, general social sciences. We have writings of Freud, we have encyclopedias and uh, some medicine and technology books. Um, some of the books were a later edition, uh, later newer fields of interest, and some were a lifelong passion of Ben Gurion, like the Kabbalah books, or the geography books and the history books, as well as Judaism and philosophy. And um, I said earlier that this was also the backstage of uh, some uh, critical moments in uh, Israel history. We talked about the Sinai campaign. Uh, even here in this little study, uh, this is where he actually drafted the final uh, or rephrased the final draft of the Declaration of Independence before they go on to the ceremony. And this is where some the most dramatic meetings around the, the date of the declaration are taking place. When Moshe Sharet came back from the United States uh, with the American opinion about the declaration, should they, should they do it or not? I mean, uh, this library and this house all in all is um, as I keep saying, a private residence, a family house, uh, but it's uh, inevitable that uh, some of his, uh, that his career or his, his work will come home as well. That's why we have here uh, next to each other a small family kitchen and a, a command center for the Minister of Defense in the same time.
So as well as with the library, it's a private hobby or a private workspace of Ben Gurion, but definitely also a, a, a space for work and a place for meetings and some uh, critical behind the scenes scenes moment. And uh, I think uh, he himself understood that uh, with uh, with the idea of uh, giving it to the public uh, later on as uh, his legacy, as a public open uh, library. Very cool. There's a question on the chat that I think I missed. Can you read it out loud? Uh, there's, there's a couple we've got now. Uh, Susan asked, uh, are there any children's books in the library? Hmm. Uh, not so much, I admit. Uh, all in all, I think uh, literature is uh, not the strongest uh, uh, part of the library. There is a nice section of uh, Hebrew literature. And also, by the way, some uh, well classics in different languages. We have uh, Don Quixote in Spanish that uh, he himself said that that's the reason that he wanted to learn Spanish. We have a bunch of classics in uh, Spanish and French. On the Hebrew book section, we do have a very nice children's book somewhere down here. Might even find it. Uh, not that he uh, bought for, him, he, for himself, but that he received as a gift from the writer. Uh, because uh, many of the books are, can also be a gift that he received from the writer themselves uh, with nice uh, inscriptions on them as well. Uh, I can't find it now, but uh, there are one or two children's books, but it really is uh, by coincidence and as a gift, not, uh, not really a field of interest that he had building this library. Very cool. Um, I've also got a few questions about the difference between the house in Tel Aviv and, and his residence in Steboker and, um, you know, how did he split his time? Why did he choose Steboker as, as a region to live? And also what the main differences between the two houses are? Uh, I think uh, I think even better than me, Rona could answer that uh, even more uh, uh, in the greater detail if she's there. Rona, I want to join in, say hi, and uh, say a few words about yeah. Steboker. Sure. Uh, hi, you guys. I'm uh, right here with you all along, giving you even answer through the chat. So regarding this house in uh, Sdeboker, let me start from telling you the story about how Ben Gurion took himself uh, to Sdeboker. What happened is the year was 1953. As, as a minister of defense, he was obliged to uh, visit a camp base of the Israeli Defense Force uh, in the Negev. Um, during his travel back to the center, he saw some tents in the desert, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, he asked his driver to stop. Uh, and he asked the, the people that were really young, like in their 20s, uh, he asked them, hey guys, what are you doing here? Uh, and they told him that they fought in this area during the independence war. And they had this like crazy idea uh, to build this kind of farm. Uh, you know, like um, cowboys farm, um, in the desert, uh, but they did realize that to build this kind of farm, uh, the climate in the Negev is not uh, really uh, appropriate for it, or it can, they can't build this kind of farm. So they built a kibbutz, uh, which is a way of settlement um, that everybody's sharing uh, whatever they have. But the difference is in the kibbutz in Sneboker that they built afterwards between uh, kibbutz uh, all around Israel that they want to build a kibbutz that doesn't have any political ideas um, like that leading them through through their life in the kibbutz because back then the, this kind of settlement the people who lived there were very political and then have a lot of ideological idea about how you need to live um, and what kind of party you have to choose or stuff like that so this is a story that, that he uh, told later uh, uh, on his first visit in this place called Steboker. Now, why did I tell you about the farm and about the cowboys? Because the literally translate to the word Steboker is cowboys field. So they couldn't build a farm, but they called the place uh, um, cowboys field. The same day, he came back home to Tel Aviv, the same evening, and he sent to the people of 
de Bouquet, a letter told them that he never envied anyone, but when he saw uh, the things that they did and when he saw uh, they tented and built and when he heard the idea of the kibbutz, um, this is why uh, he want to be part of their uh, part of their uh, community. Um, they did have some argues about whether they want the first prime minister to come live with them in the kibbutz. They choose the middle of nowhere and the desert because they want a quiet place. Um, oh yeah, uh, Boker is mourning, but Boker is uh, is is cowboy. Uh, it pronounced like uh, differently. Boker morning, Boker cowboy. I, I say that because people are uh, writing in the chat uh, about does Boker is there. No, so it's cowboy's field, not uh, morning field. Uh, either way, he sent them that he want to be part of the kibbutz and they let them be uh, part of the kibbutz. And in 1953, for the first time, he resigned <laughs> he resigned from being a prime minister uh, and together with Paula, they went lived in the Negev in Debokir. Now, a few years later, um, late 60s, they asked Ben Gurion, why did you move to Debokir? Um, and he said that he wanted to be a part of something that starts from scratch, that he want uh, with his friend to build something from nothing. Now, you would ask, Wait a minute, Ben Gurion built the state of Israel, but for him, building the state of Israel relies on the things that uh, Jews did before him. Um, he came to Israel with the second wave of immigration during the early 1900s, um, but he said that he couldn't make it without the first one that came a few decades before him. So for him to live in Sdebuker was a fulfillment of a great vision of a great dream of being this pioneer, a worker that lived in the middle of nowhere, that lived in the desert. He had this dream about the desert. He want to see it bloom. He wants the industry of Israel to be in the desert, the, uh, the science that everyone will go and live in the desert. And for him, it was not only a vision. As I already say, he resigned from being prime minister and went lived in the Negev. So this is why choosing this kind of place to live in now, the other question, and this will be just a one sentence uh, uh, answer about um, how, this, how does he split his time? You need to understand that on the first year of his living in Debokir, he wasn't a prime minister, a minister in defense. The year was 1954, but in the mid-55, uh, Moshe Sharet, the, the second prime minister, asked Ben Gurion to come back and be the minister of defense. And he came back in 56, he became again uh, prime minister of Israel. And as long he was on a roll of leading the state of Israel, he used his house here and his residence in Jerusalem, the prime minister residence. But when he, um, the second time he resigned, 63, this is when he took his stuff and moved to uh, Stebuker. In his last decade, people know uh, knew if you want to meet David Ben-Gurion, you have to go to the Negev. For him, it's going up uh, to the Negev. But he had a lot of ideas about what to do with his house in Tel Aviv. This is why, you know, he never sold it, um, never let anyone sublet it or put it on an Airbnb. He just keep it as it was. Um, so David, uh, I already show you his uh, library and told you about what Ben-Gurion wants this house to be. Um, yeah, this is the story about Nebuchadnezzar and the two houses. Very cool, very informative. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up there because it's just about to tick over to nine o'clock where we are. Um, so I'm gonna do a few thank yous and a couple of community announcements. So firstly, um, David and Rona and, and the whole team at the Ben Gurion House in Tel Aviv, thank you guys for facilitating this incredible virtual tour. Um, you guys have been providing these tours uh, for quite a while now and, and you can provide them to a range of different audiences and interest groups. Um, so anyone in our community that's you know, looking for an opportunity like this, definitely uh, look at the Ben Gurion House in Tel Aviv. Um, and of course, if we ever and eventually find ourselves physically in Israel again, um, definitely head to the Ben Gurion House because um, I can imagine that the tour physically would be um, even better than what 
it was uh, virtually. So thank you guys for, for taking the time and facilitating such an amazing tour. Um, I'm also going to take a, a brief moment to uh, mention or, or thank uh, our sponsors. Um, without them, we wouldn't be able to run, you know, the incredible events that we do. So a big thank you to them. Um, in terms of what's happening going forward, um, we're organizing a, a few more events before the end of the year. So um, stay tuned to our, our social media, our websites, uh, our emails to make sure you keep up to date with everything that's happening there. Um, I'm going to do one more community announcement. It's, it's kind of a, a really nice segue that we were able to experience the amazing library at the Ben Gurion House. Uh, there's also another library that we have, uh, which is the Lamb Jewish Library of Australia, um, which is our own uh, amazing library here. Uh, and for those that uh, don't know, and most of you will, uh, the library is running a 24 hour fundraising campaign. Um, it's their annual appeal and they're running it this Sunday. Uh, so every donation that's given is gonna be doubled up to $100,000. Um, you know, the library does some incredible work. It's, it's, it's a great resource center for um, people doing research. It, it runs incredible events, author talks, uh, lectures, it, it runs book clubs. And um, it's, it's definitely something that um, we, we all need to support in our community. So this Sunday on the 29th, um, they'll be running their annual appeal. All donations will be doubled up to 100,000. If, if you have the time and you can, um, definitely look at also maybe volunteering and making some calls for them this Sunday. Um, if you want more information, you can head to the, the LAM website or uh, email uh, info at um, ljla.org.au. Uh, so with that, I'm going to thank once again, David and Rona and the, the whole team at um, the Ben Gurion House in Tel Aviv and, and wish everyone uh, a good evening because yeah, we're going to finish there. Thanks guys. Thanks everyone. Have a nice evening.